Good evening, all. On behalf of the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice, I welcome you to the second installment of the USF uh, lecture series in the history of Jewish Christian relations. My name is Jeremy Brown, and I'm the series director. Uh, I'd like to express my thanks to the USF Department of Theology and Religious Studies, as well as the Joan and Ralph Lane Center for Catholic Studies and Social Thought for co-sponsoring with us on this exciting new program. Uh, I, I want to mention the names of two individuals without whom this initiative would never have gotten off the ground, namely THRS Program Assistant Monica Doblado uh, and Professor Aaron Han Tapper. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the following Bay Area community organizations, the San Francisco Interfaith Council, St. Dominic's uh, Catholic Church, Lairhouse Judaica, Congregation Beth Shalom, and Grace Cathedral. Before proceeding, I'd like to say uh, something about the JSSJ program. Founded in 2008, the USF SWIG program is the first and only program in the United States formally linking Jewish studies with social justice. Our program offers numerous courses related to this interdisciplinary field, such as the Jewish Christian relationship, Jewish and Islamic mysticism, social justice, activism, and the Jews, the Jewish American experience, for forgiving the unforgivable, and Jews, Judaisms, and Jewish identities. We're also adding three new courses in the fall, and you can uh, see the table outside for flyers on the new course offerings. Further, each year we put on a number of annual events. Each fall we have a speaker series related to Jewish identities, highlighting the rich diversity of Jews in terms of ethnicity, gender, national sensibility, sensibilities, sex, sexual orientation, race, and other social identities. Last year, we held our first annual human rights lecture program when we brought Lieutenant General Rom Romeo Dallaire to campus, the head of UN forces in Rwanda who refused orders to evacuate the East African nation when genocide began. Each spring semester, we hold an annual social justice lecture and annual social justice Passover Seder, addressing events such as poverty in Haiti, genocide in Chad, the Sudan, and the Congo, as well as gender justice. Finally, we offer unique educational programs related to the transformation of national conflict, con conflicts, such as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We regularly partner with a number of different Bay Area based organizations such as the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco as well as local synagogues and mosques. This spring, in addition to tonight's program, we have two more events, both of which are free, open to the public, and take place here on our campus. One week from this evening on Wednesday, uh, April 5th, also at 6 p.m., also here in the Morosky Room, we will hold the third and final installment of our lecture series dealing with Jewish-Christian relations in the modern period. We'll learn from recent Guggenheim Fellowship recipient, Professor Naomi Seidman of the GTU. Uh, her contribution to the series is titled A Gift to the Jewish People, the Yiddish New Testament, and the 20th Century Mission to the Jews. Professor Aaron Brigham, director of USF's Lane Center, will respond. And in two weeks, on Thursday, April 13th, we will have our eighth annual Social Justice Passover Seder where we'll focus on the imperative to treat all of those living within the political boundaries of the United States with justice, regardless of their documentation. The Seder will be co-led by social justice activist, acclaimed writer, and poet, Andrew Raymer, together with a, present, with a representative from Bend the Ark, the leading progressive Jewish organization working to make this country one that honors the dignity of all communities. If you're interested in being put on the JSSJ listserv, please add your name to the sign-up sheet on the table just outside the door there. Uh, now let's begin the program for this evening officially. Uh, I'd like to begin by laying out some of my ambitions for the series, and I readily admit my hopes are high. Like the seven echelons of heaven to which ancient Jews and Christians aspired to ascend, I've come up with a list of seven basic objectives for this series. First objective, the series aims to stimulate exchange between researchers, students, faculty, staff, and the community at large in exploring the 2,000-year history of relations between Judaism and Christianity 
examining ways in which the protracted relationship between these two religions has propelled the internal development of each. This is a history characterized by virtually the entire gamut of relationship dynamics, admiration, fascination, and cooperation, as well as abhorrence, deceit, and violence, both inflamed xenophilia and virulent xenophobia. Another objective of the series, number two, is to create a forum for discussing this complex relationship from a perspective which is neither apologetic nor polemical. Our goal is not to defend or justify a history fraught with violence, but rather to impart a better understanding of the profound role that interreligious polemic has played in the complex formation of both Jewish and Christian religious identities through the centuries. In light of recent shifts in the tone of national political rhetoric, and this is objective number three, now is an important time to reflect on the profound dangers of polemicizing against vulnerable populations in order to consolidate and homogenize national identity. While many aspects of the Jewish-Christian relationship are unique, sociologically speaking, thinking about this particular relationship gives us pause to reflect on the kind of asymmetrical relationships that exist between communities with disproportionate access to forms of social, legal, and political representation. Objective four, USF has an avowed interest in promoting Catholic identity among its student body, while at the same time seeking to impart values of social justice. One of the more confusing, sometimes painful discoveries for students exploring the history of Jewish-Christian relations is that the exaltation of triumphalist Christian claims of religious supremacy, claims reinforced by demonstrable assertions of Christian political dominance, does not sit comfortably with what we think of today when we talk about social justice values. To the contrary, historically speaking, such claims of supremacy and dominance have exacerbated a rhetoric of violence against outgroups, a rhetoric which has mandated the subordination and persecution of religious and ethnic populations out of step with church norms. As an educational institution, it is incumbent upon us to help students account for this seeming discrepancy between past and present. This lecture series intends to pr prompt critical conversations about the tensions which exist between, on the one hand, the promotion of an historically uncritical sense of religious identity, and on the other hand, the pursuit of social justice values. Objective five, while the series is offered at a Catholic institution avowing a Jesuit mission, it does not adopt the approach of promoting one particular religious identity above any other. Rather, it aims to provide resources from the history of religions for an audience of any or no religious background, resources for thinking about how communal identities are forged in relationship to the perceived identities of others, and resources for thinking about how <clears throat> intercommunal dynamics impact the way groups define themselves internally. Six, this lecture series is intended to ameliorate the strained relationship between religious communities, but through the lucid evaluation of the past and the promotion of historical understanding. Thus, rather than featuring the leaders of local religious communities, the series highlights the work of our region's preeminent scholars. The prioritization of scholarly accounts is based on the cautious premise that any community-based efforts at reconciliation that are not founded on a rigorous assessment of the past will not likely yield more than tentative results. The lecture conversation format of the program intends to make historically critical perspectives on Jewish-Christian relations more accessible to the broader community. And lastly, number seven, I hope that increased public awareness of the historical problems which with, with which we're wrestling in this series will have a reciprocally stimulating effect on the scholarship itself. And moreover, that the series will encourage and empower scholars to reflect judiciously on the public applications of their research. <clears throat> in the first event of the series, we heard from Dr. Eva Morocek, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at UC Davis, who delivered the provocatively titled lecture, The Embarrassing Bible, Ancient Jews and Christians on the Disappointment of Scripture. 
through a close reading of some fascinating apocalyptic, rabbinic, and patristic texts, Morocek put the lie to the commonplace assumption that ancient Jews and Christians universally regarded their scriptural canons as infallible repositories for the entirety of divine revelation. Rather, she demonstrated several instances where ancient Jews and Christians expressed dissatisfaction, disappointment, and even embarrassment with the scriptures they possessed. Thus, she taught us that for all ostensible differences, some ancient Jews and Christians shared the common preoccupation that their Bibles might, in fact, be lacking. Tonight, we convene part two of our series dealing with the Middle Ages. We're very fortunate this evening to welcome from across the bay Professor Dina Aronoff, director of the Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies uh, of the Graduate Theological Union. Aronoff's teaching and research interests include Jewish society and culture in medieval and early modern Europe, rabbinic literature, medieval patterns of Jewish thought, as well as continuity and change in Jewish history. She is presently doing some very interesting work on the culture of maternal care among medieval Jews. After her lecture, Professor Aronoff will be joined in conversation by Professor Katrina Olds of the USF History Department. Then we will open the floor for questions, time permitting. So now, without further ado, Professor Aronoff will teach us about the importance of, ha of household for understanding medieval Jewish-Christian relations. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to apologize for being late. I really value your time, and it's an evening event. Thank you for being here. Um, can even take a 30-second stretch. Is, can everyone just stand up for a moment and stretch your legs? Just do me a favor, because if you were here a little early, then you've been sitting for a while. Great, great. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that introduction. And it's really an honor to be here and a pleasure to be here um, at USF. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, I teach at the Graduate Theological Union, which is a consortium of a variety of schools, including the a Jesuit school. And so I feel a sense of uh, fellowship uh, with this campus in that regard. Um, so in a series devoted to Jewish-Christian relations, and I take very seriously the fact that you, uh, many of you are students on a campus that's addressing so directly the relationship between Christianity, Catholicism, and the wider world and the variety of communities that compose this world. In a series like this, I would say that the medieval lecture, that's me, um, has a formidable role to play. And this is because the medieval period of Jewish history is often equated with or most famous for kind of the dark times in Jewish Christian relations. Um, there was a great historian at uh, Columbia University um, who, I'm just trying to get this, who uh, early in the, in the mid 20th century decided that he was going to undo a typical way of looking at Jewish history, which was the lachrymose view of Jewish history. A view of Jewish history is just a veil of tears, memorize the series of persecutions, um, and then you've basically got the gist of Jewish history. Salah Baron was an American Jewish historian who wanted to change that up and talk a little bit more about how the Jews lived as opposed to how they died. And that revision of Jewish history, I would say, played out very much so in the medieval case, because the medieval Jewish history in Christian Europe was seriously often just a timeline of persecutions, expulsions. Um, and so Salah Baron had his work cut out for him to revise this dark portrait of Jewish history. Um, the next phase, the, this phase of revising this notion of how Jews coexisted with Christians in the medieval period was to turn away from doing a kind of top-down style of history writing where you examine uh, religious edicts, canon law, political decrees, and take all of that kind of high uh, documentary evidence and assume that that's going to tell you something about day-to-day -day life. I mean, that was the kind of old way of operating in terms of history. 
Um, but in the 20th century, as many of you know, and especially if you've been studying with Dr. Brown, that there's a move towards social history, exploring everyday life, household life, family life, economic relations, social class, Marxist analysis even. Um, and once that move into social history is um, introduced, suddenly you start to see that there's a lot of contact between Jews and Christians. I often have this joke when people say to me, oh, you study medieval Jewish history. How are the medieval Jews doing? And I say, better and better, thank you for asking. Because they really are. It turns out that there were centuries, generations of coexistence um, between Jews and Christians. And the more that one studied household life and the kind of intricacies of kind of the everyday goings-ons of earning a living, raising a family, one starts to see the ways in which Jewish and Christian society were not that distinct one from the other after all. Now, I say that, but I want to issue a little bit of a caution. Um, Jacob Katz was a historian um, at Hebrew University writing in the 60s and in the 70s. He was, uh, some people think of him as the first social historian of the Jews, although he, wasn't, he didn't do social history so much in the way we think of it. And he had this to say about studying medieval Jewish-Christian interaction. He says the following. Historical research has established the existence of common features, I'll just, reciprocal influences in the sphere of social and even religious life among Jews and Christians. But here's the but. Similarity, reciprocal influence, and frequent contact are not, however, tantamount to social integration. To achieve this, Katz continues, members of different groups which live within the same social framework must be consciously aware of some, some common values. Um, again, I'm kind of thinking about the undergrads in the room. Just kind of interesting to think about what makes for distinct societies and what equals social integration? When do you think of groups as separate, and when do you think that they actually have a kind of common social identity? Um, Jacob Katz, writing in 1961, argued that what has to happen is there has to be a conscious uh, de uh, kind of deployment of a common set of values. You have to all be able to look at some set of values to which you're all um, obligated. So Jacob Katz, here he is a social historian finding all of this evidence of economic interaction and social interaction, but he actually argues that frequent contact and even evidence of influence does not, is not tantamount to social integration. So where are we now? What I would say is that as feminist studies started to influence um, Jewish studies, more, there was more of a turn towards the household life and family life. And the turn to those materials, it's arguable, have started to suggest a far more integrated social milieu than was previously considered. And a very strong example of this new direction in Jewish studies is Elisheva Baumgarten's groundbreaking volume, Mothers and Children is the title, Jewish Family Life in Medieval Europe. In this work, Baumgarten finds evidence of close contacts between Jewish and Christian women in the realm of family life. And I'm tempted to kind of go through some of the details of it. It's all so interesting. How one cared for or protected a pregnant woman. What kind of amulets or um, folk remedies were employed around pregnancy and childbirth. Midwifery science that was common to both uh, Jews and Christians. So she uncovers this, what she calls a world shared by Jewish and Christian women. In other words, when you do history from, the, from below, which is what uh, social historian Jim Sharp called the history from below, suddenly you start to see that it's not really two separate societies at all. In today's lecture, I, I would like to actually press the dialectic of our historical thinking back in the other direction. Um, meaning, if the top-down approach studying religious dogma and doctrine makes us think that the two were, you know, <laughs> kind of never met, they lived in two separate worlds, worlds apart, and if the recent studies of social history have started to establish the frequency of contact and connection, 
Um, what I would like to do is now dig a little bit deeper into those materials regarding household life, and of course, integrate the hybridity of the household context in terms of the presence of Jews and Christians together. But I would like to also explore the ways in which that very household, that on the one hand seems to indicate that Jews and Christians inhabited a common sphere, was also the very place in which the particulars of Jewishness were produced. It's almost as if an inadvertent consequence of the effort to revise the old model of radical social separation has led to a neglect of the ways in which the household was, in fact, a site of particular Jewish cultural production. And if we redirect the very same material, say, that Baumgarten brings to her work, if we redirect it from this portrait of common ground to see its role in the production of Jewish difference, I think something productive happens there. So our case study will be the conversos of Spain. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking for Katrina. I wanna, OK, <laughs> I keep looking. Um, so Katrina, as a scholar of early modern Spanish materials, I'm looking forward to your question. So I'm going to try to move along. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background about Jewish life in Spain. It starts with a lachrymose beginning. Now I'm self-conscious. In 1391, a series of fatal anti-Jewish riots erupted in southern Castile that would forever alter the landscape of Jewish life in Spain. From that date forward, Iberian soil was host to a growing number of baptized Jews, or conversos, who, despite continued relations with existing Jewish communities, slowly integrated into various domains of Christian society. Their numbers were augmented in the early decades of the 15th century by the coercive proceedings of the Tortosa Disputation and accompanying, accompanying public baptisms. These waves of, of conversion posed new challenges to Iberian Christian society. The evident hybridity of the conversos, we'll see their identity was complex, undermined the notion of the pure Christian cosmos that had begun to take hold among royal and ecclesiastical authorities in Spain. Concerns regarding the authenticity of the Christian commitments of the conversos led to the establishment of limpieza de sangre statutes, meant to limit the participation of these newly baptized Christians in the upper echelons of civil and political life. Suspicion of the continued Jewish practices of these new Christians led to the establishment of an inquisition in 1478. And, and here's a little known fact, it was the danger that professing Jews posed in that they could serve, they could corrupt the Christian identity of the new Christians that is cited as the basis of the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. That date might be better known to you, the 1492. It's just important to know that there is a century leading up to that date um, with where a concern of the purity of the Christian city and to some extent even cosmos was being undermined by the presence of these um, of the conversos themselves, but to the extent that the Jewish community could serve to educate or tempt or corrupt these new Christians, it was a, it was a, a blend that was almost was intolerable. One of the chief questions to have occupied historians of the previous half century, so again back to Sala Baron and then his student Yosef Yerushalmi, who was my teacher, has been the following question, which could be surprising, again, to some of you. The question is, the conversos who, after the establishment of the Inquisition, the conversos are repeatedly drawn into the Inquisition um, because they're being accused of Judaizing, of continuing their Jewish practices. And the questions that historians have asked is, were they actually persisting in their Jewish practices? Or was it simply something that the Inquisition was making up? Now, if that sounds kind of crazy, I think at a first glance that is an absurd question. Thousands of records, the Inquisitional dockets are enormous and immense, spanning hundreds of years, multiple continents, and they describe the Judaizing practices of these conversos in painstaking detail. 
Was this simply a, did it lack any basis in converso life? Now, this idea that crypto-Judaism, I'm slowly folding in these other terms, so hidden Jewish practices, that this was a fabrication of the Inquisition, was put forward by the historian Benzio Netanyahu. And this is, he actually passed away just a few years ago. Netanyahu argued that Jewish practices did not persist among the conversos. Such commitments, you know, commitments to Jewish life, Jewish law, no doubt dwindled quickly through the generations. Instead, said Netanyahu, these accusations, hey you, you're still lighting Sabbath candles, you're still observing the laws of the dietary restrictions, was actually just a way in which the Christian majority could terrorize, and it was a terrifying uh, institution, the Inquisition, and then perhaps rid themselves of their quickly assimilating new Christian competitors. Ben Sion Netanyahu is saying it's actually because of the ways in which these new Christians integrated, you know, and you could say passed, that there needed to be this apparatus that was going to weed them out for their religious differences. Netanyahu says they didn't have lingering religious commitments, but they were still distinctive as a socioeconomic entity. And this alien status that they had could not be undone with baptism. It'd be interesting to talk about how it challenges a kind of Christian notion of baptism as really allowing full entry to the, the Christian uh, to the church. So Yosef Yerushalmi here, you know, takes this thesis of Netanyahu and says, no, that's not possible. Of course, Jewish practices persisted among the conversos. This was not a figment of the inquisitorial imagination. There was a living current of crypto-Judaism. He, if, according to Yerushalmi, one of the greatest indications of this is that there were these many illustrious and prolific conversos who, as soon as they emigrated from Iberia to Europe or to the Ottoman context, they would um, become some of the most articulate Jewish apologists, messianists like Shabtai Tzvi, heretics like Spinoza. These are all figures who have a converso past in the Iberian context. The belated emergence of such Jewish personalities, argues Yerushalmi, is a reflection of the persistence of Jewish life in Spain. Now, at the center of this debate, of course, is how to read the documentary evidence thousands of documents produced by the Inquisition that describe the Jewish practices in minute detail. Yerushalmi obviously reads these as reliable. Netanyahu argues that these records are fabricated formulaic accusations, and they include confessions elicited through torture. And if you're curious to read more about the means by which the Inquisition uh, elicited such confessions, there's a lot of literature on that. I'm going to skip one point there. Um, OK, so here's our question. The converso population, were they Christian for all intents and purposes, which is Netanyahu's argument, or are they a group of Jews who persisted in vigorous commitments to Judaism, albeit one kind of altered in the kind of complex context of Jewish and Christian factors. They went to Catholic school. They would often attend mass. So their Jewidaism changed through the centuries and, has, uh, and assimilates a lot of interesting Catholic features. Um, but nevertheless, did they have a crypto-Jewish commitment that the Inquisition was going to weed out? Rather than take a position in this long-standing debate, what I would like to examine more critically is the very distinction between ritual observances and the socioeconomic patterns. Okay, that's, that's what I want to rethink. First, I would like to suggest that the sociological aspects of conversal life, and we're going to go through some examples, are not marginal to crypto-Judaism, but central to it. In fact, the social patterns of the conversos, practices such as endogamy, they tended to marry each other, endosociality, they tended to be social with one another, business patterns, trading with one another, food habits, household culture, all of these details are carefully recorded in the inquisitional records. It's as if 
It's a strange thing to say, but it's as if they were proto-social historians. Who are you marrying? Who are you hanging out with? I mean, th those are the kinds of details that appear in the inquisitional records with tragic consequences. Um, so rather than treat the ritual practice as the ultimate signifier of Jewish commitments, let's talk about those sociological factors, many of which happen in the household context. Let's talk about those as significant expressions of religious identity. In other words, you see, Yosef Yerushalmi, one of the big problems for the historian who wants to say, yes, they were Judaizing. They had secret Jewish practices. The problem is, the big mystery is, how is that possible? Hundreds of years, for hundreds of years, without synagogues and libraries and rabbis and Talmud study and all of these kind of like almost metonyms, little mini symbols for what you think Jewish life is. All of that is gone in Iberia. What on earth could possibly explain the persistence of a Murano, another term for this culture, um, culture over all of this time? This is why Netanyahu says, I'll tell you the answer to that question. It didn't persist. Culture can't just persist like that in such a total vacuum when you're cut off from the, you could say, the nodes of cultural production. I think it's probably clear where I'm going with this, which is that there's a much more ready answer available to these historians, and that is to look at the continuities in the social and domestic sphere. This mysterious persistence of Marinism is not because of, I could go into what some of the uh, bases are provided. Yushami says at one point, maybe when the conversos traveled abroad, they would meet with a rabbi and secretly study some Talmud, like some kind of quick, rabbinic download and then come back and, and teach everybody. In other words, they're stuck looking for the source in the more public institutional, um, in a sense also male modality, since the rabbinic elites were all male. But all Yerushalmi had to do was open up his kind of frame of analysis and consider the broader spectrum of Jewish life, and is sitting right there before him, the great, vast continuity in the household context. Furthermore, let's just talk about the inquisitional records for a moment. I concur with Netanyahu that the inquisitional records that describe Jewish rituals are suspect. If you'd pull from the library shelf a uh, kind of publication of any of these inquisitional records, you'll see the repetition of what a, it becomes a formulaic list of behaviors. Quote, observing Sabbath, regard for the Sabbath as the principal festival, neither giving nor taking nor buying or selling, dressing in festive clothing like the Sunday of the Christians, candle lighting, abstaining from eating leavened goods on Passover. It's the same ritual list that would appear when, often when an inquisition would set up shop in a town, they would post in the public square. Are you seeing these behaviors in a household? Lighting candles, fasting in times that don't map on the Christian calendar. Indeed, a similar list of ritual behaviors appears in the expulsion document itself. Now, the conversos may well have persisted in observing these rituals, but it is very difficult to assess the inquisitional records on those points because those activities had become a kind of canon of Jewish ritual practice. This is what Judaizing looks like. In contrast to that, the social habits that appear in the dockets are idiosyncratic and detailed. I mean, so I, I'm just going to jump ahead and give you some examples. Social visits. And I, I hope some of you are thinking about this in terms of your own identities, like who am I, what society do I belong to, and how would someone assess that? Is it where I hang out, where I live, the language that I speak, who I eat with, the food that I eat? I mean, th it's the same kinds of questions about defining a social group. So social visits appear frequently in the inquisitional records as evidence against the accused. One record describes a couple who gave a fruit basket to a new mother, which apparently was a Jewish way of congratulating a new parent. One document reports simply that Jews visited a new Christian home, meaning if a Jew visited you, if you were a new Christian, 
it was signaling, oh, they're still socializing with Jews. Now, this type of socializing is not a ceremonial observance per se, but it's testimony to the importance of association, if you want to use the technical term, in the retention of Jewish characteristics. And I don't want to get into the business as to whether that means they still have a Jewishness to their life or if it's just a social identity. I, don't, I think I want to just question whether that's a meaningful distinction. Endogamy, I can't, there's a, who they marry appears a lot in the text as well. I'm, um, I might not have to rush that much. I probably have like, what do I have? Ten? A little less even. Ten. Okay, so it's good. It's good that I'm hopping around. Food. Food is really big. Um, in the Inquisitional record, some of you may know that this is years ago. It's probably 20 years ago now. The New York Times published a book of recipes from the Inquisitional records because full-on recipes appear in the dockets as incriminating evidence. Now, it's going to get more complex in these examples. Food preparation related to the Sabbath, OK? Here's one of the accusations. And it's kind of a funny, old-fashioned translation to evoke the medieval um, Spanish. On those said Sabbaths, they ate what they had cooked the Friday before. Because the said wife of Juan de la Sierra and her daughter Leonor de la Sierra, the maiden, and the said Isabel Gonzalez were always accustomed to cooking on the said Fridays for the Sabbath, stews of fish and sardines, and sometimes made with eggplant and with onions and coriander and spices. And they ate them on the following Sabbath day. You, I, I, if this were a smaller context, this is when I would want you know, some thoughts. So I'm glad that we're going to leave time for discussion. What is happening here? This sounds like a report of Sabbath observance. According to Jewish law, on the Sabbath, you don't cook. You don't alter the state of a food from raw to cooked using a fire. You certainly don't light a fire. But even if you had an existing fire, you don't cook food. You don't change it from one state to another. So look at what this report is saying. This person is not cooking on Saturday. They're doing a very strange thing, which before refrigeration was really strange. Cooking, doing a lot of work to create a delicious stew for the next day. Is that an observance of Jewish law? Perhaps. Look what else if appears here, all of the various spices and kinds of food. Here's other examples. And on those Sabbath days, they ate some stews prepared on the previous Friday made of eggs and cheese and parsley and hot dishes and spices. And sometimes they made them of eggplant and other times of carrots, depending on the season. They ate the said stews cold and they celebrated and enjoyed themselves all those Sabbath days until nightfall when they went to their home. I simply want to point out how difficult it is to distinguish between the observance of Jewish law and the persistent habits of a Jewish home. Now, eating cold food on a Saturday is, I think, record of Sabbath observance. However, the record also includes food preparation in such detail that is, does not correspond to Jewish law. In fact, in some of the records, simply the list of Jewish cuisine appears as evidence of Jewishness without reference to Jewish law. In one testimony, the accused is described as cutting up meat and then throwing it into a stew pot to cook with spices for a very long time. No mention of the Sabbath at all. It's simply the slow cooked stew that establishes the persistence of Jewishness in this home. Also, one has this idea that the smells and the spices of the Jewish cooking seem to have persisted after baptism. I, I sometimes I like to say, if you are forcibly converted, the next day there's still one way that you know how to roast a chicken. It's not like there's cooking classes after the baptismal font. The, Jewish kitchen still going to smell the same. And perhaps a Jewish kitchen did smell a little bit different, because perhaps it had more North African spices. I sometimes, th th there isn't one kind of Jewish food. One of the ways to, I like to think about Jewish food is it's food that has traveled. It's food from somewhere else. That's Jewish food. It's 
It's going to be different everywhere across the globe, but it might be a little different from the kind of ambient cuisine because it's traveled from somewhere else. So their kitchen still had something distinctive happening there that was strange. Now here's one more example, I think, raising the ambiguity even another notch. The said Isabel, I'm reading again from the record, when she was about to slaughter some bird, okay, chicken, you know, poultry you slaughtered in the household context, a big animal a butcher took care of and sold the pieces, but a chicken was something you had in the household. Prior to slaughtering it, she would examine and pass the knife by her nail in the Jewish way, and then slaughter the bird, watching over the blood as per the Jewish rite and ceremony. Now this is an interesting case. Jewish law requires that the slaughter of a bird take place with a perfectly sharp knife, with a very specific approach to the neck that's actually meant to reduce the suffering of the animal. So there was, I'm sorry for the vivid, I should have warned a bit, kind of a uh, little vivid imagery, but the other way to kill a chicken is you just break its neck, it's easy. Um, the Jewish way was to use a knife and to check it first. So what happens the day after conversion? I keep coming back to that moment when you decide you're gonna cook one of the chickens that's maybe done with its egg laying years. Are you gonna do the, the method that you've seen your mother do and her mother and her mother and her mother? Are you gonna kind of learn how the Christian way of, isn't that funny? Is there a Christian way to kill the chicken? No one's, no one's doing those kinds of cultural interventions. And it's visceral, you know, when you're killing an animal, there's a way in which the rituals that accompany it is, is an important way of engaging in that activity, which by itself and on its own has a certain horrific quality. So to suddenly not have any of those guideposts and to just kind of get at the animal without any guidance is almost impossible to imagine. It's gonna be ritualized and they will have at, at their disposal the Jewish ritual means by which to slaughter a chicken. So, is that a persistent devotion to Jewish life? Is that someone who is almost kind of like a martyr in the name of observing Jewish law? Or is that someone whose Jewish habits are just a part of their person and it can't simply be undone? And I will say, I've, I've, when I've thought about this, I sometimes worry that I, I could be belittling the religious devotion of some of these people, many of whom are women. And I don't want to rule out the possibility that many of these behaviors were intentional, clandestine efforts to sustain Jewish practice. Um, but as I said, as a historian, it's actually harder to get at that because those signature ritual performances are formulaic as they appear in the records. Whereas some of this sociological detail just seems much more true. And so the broader subject, and I'm concluding here, What I want to say is the inquisitional records show us how important these sociological factors are in sustaining Jewishness and how central the household is in sustaining them. All of these things, what you eat, when you clean your home, when you change the oil in the lamps, when you change the linens of the household, when you sweep. There's a famous idea that conversos, Moranos, secret Jews, would sweep into their house. And I've actually seen historians struggle. What is the basis? Must be some mystical idea. You're gonna sweep, you don't wanna sweep the demons out and people are trying. I'm just saying, no, because you were probably sweeping on the wrong day of the week. And so even though the most natural thing to do is to sweep right out the front door, if you do that, then everyone knows that you're cleaning on Friday. But that's not okay. It's not even okay that you did your laundry on Wednesday or Thursday. You're out of sync. So you sweep into the house, which is a mess and makes it a lot harder, but it's a way to hide what you're doing. So the circumstances of the Inquisition and the dismantling of public and institutional Jewish life in Iberia allowed these domestic aspects to acquire visibility. And usually these aspects of Jewishness and of religion generally are neglected because greater status is accorded to institutions, higher intellectual life, in the case of Judaism, rabbinic governance. But operating all along, and for the most part unrecorded, 
are the cultural and social factors that contribute to Jewish identity. Descriptions of the lingering custom of how one bakes bread, slaughters a chicken, a lingering preference for lean meat. That was also incriminating. Why did I came home, the servant says, with a beautiful, juicy, fatty piece of meat. I look into the pot. It's been stripped clean of every bit of fat. She salted it so it's horrible to eat. So is this observance in a compromised way of Jewish law with regard to making red meat kosher? Or is this just the kind of visceral habit of this head of household? And more generally, I just want to conclude with a return to where I started. When we redirect our attention to household life, we start to see how the household is this place in which a lot of the particulars of a religious culture are produced. So this is a corrective to the tendency to say, oh, look, when you, when you gaze upon women's life, look, it's, it, they're all together here. Look at this common world they live in. Look at how they have the same folk remedies for pregnancy. It's actually a certain kind of way to, I don't know, uh, slightly primitivize the, the household realm by thinking of it as this kind of folk, this place of common folklore that um, you know, kind of operates almost as a subculture. Um, I think some of that is there, but I don't want to lose sight of another very important function of the household context in terms of Jewish Christian difference, which is that it really was the place where the differences that mattered, it turns out, of food and identity were actually being produced. Thank you. get this event catered next time. Um, now we're going to have uh, Dina join in conversation by Professor Olds of the USF History Department. Great. So, I don't think I have a mic on. Right here. I'll give it a tap to see. Do it? Hello. Why don't well, you just take mine? OK. Well, that's probably it. You can hear me, right? <laughs> Thanks. OK. Um, Thank you so much for a really fascinating paper. And in the interest of time and the hopes of hearing some questions from the audience, uh, I will limit myself to the briefest of remarks. Um, as you know, I'm a historian of early modern Spain. And I'm familiar with some of the materials you're describing from a, from a different angle. Um, but as a historian who's not a specialist in Jewish history, I've often been very frustrated in an effort to understand what exactly did constitute Jewish ritual, Jewish belief, Jewish identity in the Middle Ages. Um, and too often, we are assured that this was a story of continuity and perseverance only, um, and that things like the laws of kosher, the kashrut laws, were the same as they are today, for example. Um, and even very smart and responsible scholars describe Spanish Jews often in terms that seem to owe much more to modern and particularly post-Holocaust questions than medieval ones, um, as you described in the beginning of your, of your talk very well. And what I really like about your talk is how much your work has the potential, and, and I know you're aware of this, um, to move us out of this kind of, I would argue, sterile debate about belief, um, in which Netanyahu and then scholars such as your mentor and nearly everybody else has been arguing about whether conversos maintain their Judaism or not. Um, and what you, you don't really talk about, but is implicit, I think, in what you're doing is, is shifting from this realm of belief to the realm of practice. And as historians know very well, the question of intention is almost impossible to, to sound out. And the question of what somebody really believes in their heart of hearts it, we can never access. Uh, what evidence we have is in what they do. Um, and so in a way, the reason I think that it's a sterile debate about whether they were Jews or not, they maintain their belief or not, is that we just don't know. But you found, I think, a way around that problem. And, and, and I would say maybe even if you could, I don't know if you feel comfortable pushing it even further into the realm of ritual, or if you feel that that does too much along the lines of what you were saying mm -hmm. um, to kind of primitivize, as you said, which I'd like to uh, dig into a little more. Um, 
But this type of ahistorical essentialism, the notion that there are enduring characteristics of certain types of people that are not subject to the normal processes of historical change, is very common in the historiography, um, not only on this topic, but in particular, and sometimes for, for well-intentioned reasons. Um, so the, there's a naive assumption of eternal, supposedly Jewish characteristics on the part of well-meaning scholars who often, at least we hope it's unwittingly, unwittingly reproduce some of the, the worst stereotypes about, about Jews then and now. Um, even relatively benign assertions, such as, oh, well, so-and-so was, was very learned and his family was concerned with learning because he was a converso, is a bit problematic and a bit heavy with some stereotypical weight, I would say. Um, so what you've done, as I've already said, is, is look um, in some really promising directions. Um, the, as you might know, some of the folks in the audience might know that the Muslims in Spain were also subjected to forced conversion and then expulsion in 1609. And there's some parallel scholarship on Moriscos who stayed. Instead of agreeing to leave, secretly said, I'm old Christian and just stayed, or came over to the Indies. And there's Inquisition trials in which there's similar accusations about what they do. Um, and, and so. I'm interested to know where that might overlap or not uh, with, with what you're talking about and what, what emerges. Um, I really like how you end with this idea of looking for practices that may or may not have been done consciously, but that signal some degree of continuity with Judaism. And I'm reminded of this example of Luis de Carvajal, a crypto Jew tried by the Inquisition in Mexico and who describes learning about his family's belief from an early brother, an older brother, I'm sorry. Um, and all of a sudden he realizes all of these things about his family that were different practices that he didn't understand before make sense. Um, and there's a lot of ongoing research on this case and what it might tell us about the purportedly Jewish ancestry of many Catholic families in today's New Mexico. So bringing it around to how does this all play out, um, students in my class will remember this example because they read a really great graphic novel about it called El Illuminado, the first week of class. Um, but this has led to a curious phenomenon whose implications I'd really love to hear more from you about, the so-called crypto-Jews of New Mexico. Um, otherwise, as we've mentioned, straight out Catholic, Hispanic, of, of Hispanic descent, who wonder, for example, about the stars of David on their ancestors' tombs. Um, and this phenomenon has caused a lot of debate, not the least of which is for the reason you describe. What makes somebody Jewish? Is it belief? Is it practice? Is it the hope that maybe they had been Jewish at some point? Um, is it, yeah. So these kind of what you called in an earlier draft, cultural remainders. Um, the other question I have is about Inquisition testimony. Sometimes in Inquisition testimony we get cultural remainders, and sometimes we just get idiosyncratic accusations by disgruntled neighbors, many of whom, in spite of the announcements and the listing of what Judaism was, were entirely unclear on the concept. And, and maybe you've encountered some of these in the records. Um, one wonders, for example, in this context about the fruit basket. Is that really a Jewish practice? One wonders, right? Um, and you also see, I've seen cases where somebody is playing cards, he's a gambler, and he's about to lose, and he gets a card he doesn't like, and he swears about it using the word Jew. And he's denounced as a possible crypto Jew because he uses the word. And you can imagine the gamblers are thinking, uh-oh, that special charge word was mentioned, either I'm going to use it against him or it's going to be used against me, but not clear at all <laughs> what constitutes Judaism. So that's just a little um, uh, interesting wild card, so to speak, to take into account. The last thing I wanted to ask you, and please feel free not to answer me right here if you'd rather take questions, it's, it's up to you, but I'm so curious about um, what you think might be at stake the larger stakes of your argument. You talk about not wanting to trivialize people's devotion. Um, and uh, you, one gets the sense that looking to the home rather than to, for example, more recognizable rabbinic dictates or halakha or things like that, 
what might be at stake for those who would find this objectionable today? Um, what does what would that shift in focus? What would that looking for a different red thread, perhaps, that connects Jews throughout centuries that isn't uh, Talmudic study? What would that mean about Judaism today? Um, and can you say a little more? Uh, or if you can, um, about gender, as you mentioned in, in passing near the end, why the importance of these practices has often been dismissed as kind of mere folkways, and what it would mean, not just for history, but also for debates in and around contemporary Judaism to look to the home and, and to women for continuity of, of Jewish identity. So, thank you. Lucky students. <laughs> I want to take your class. I, I um, did my best to take some notes as you were sharing, but mostly I thought that you raised some provocative questions. Um, and one of the things you zeroed in on, among many, is that implicit in what I'm doing is to center, to ask this question of, you could say, Jewish continuity or Jewish cultural production to, to relocate that from rabbinic authority, say, into household life. And as Jeremy knows, my current project, a bit more current than this, is to actually talk about the cultural aspects of child rearing, the earliest phases of child care, another realm of human experience that is either invisible or maybe even repressed, if we want to go the psychoanalytic route. But it's a realm of human experience that doesn't frequently make it into academic discourse. But it's our, and if it does make it into academic discourse, it's thought of as a biologically driven, almost culturally neutral thing, you know, burping, feeding, changing diapers, sleeping. It's just, it's, it's a kind of, again, another visceral experience that Kristeva says, you know, can even provoke a kind of nausea for people. So we just sort of forget that phase of utter dependence and move on. But actually that phase is highly stylized in how it is played out. Those first months and years of life is when speech is acquired, gender formation, um, posture, how often do you see a parent and child walking along and they have the exact same gait or the same funny way of um, moving their features? I suppose you could argue that some of it is genetic, but why not look at the much more obvious thing, which is that in the first months and years of life, this pretty unfinished uh, human being comes into the world and then is finished in that context, that relational context with often the mother or the kind of immediate household context. And so, again, it's just kind of taking, taking it even further to say, if you want to look to see where the cultural particulars are produced, how far have we come from the house of study now? We're all the way, we're in the diapers. And that's where it is? Now, so what people have at stake, I will tell you there's a lot, which is, don't go too far in marginalizing the formulations, religious formulations, or halacha of Jew or Jewish law. Um, isn't that, too, a factor? Um, and I think what I would want to, the where I need to soften what I'm doing is to say that there's a, it's a kind of mutually, it's a reciprocal or symbiotic s system where the formulations and dictates of Jewish law reflect the existing custom, which was itself informed by earlier formulations of the law, which was itself informed by custom. So then you want to say, OK, but take it, keep going. Where's the beginning? When did it start? And I, I really think that, to me, that's one of the mystery points of any kind of particular ethnic, linguistic, or social phenomenon, which is that first start of it. When did this loose confederation of basically Canaanite tribes who worshipped El start to acquire so many distinguishing characteristics that they became Israel? Where the Sabbath was their kind of trademark practice. So um, 
I do want to bring back into my discussion the place of religious dictates, but I actually want to see those dictates as themselves a product of the, as you said, the practice, the common practice. Thank you. Do we have some time for some questions? I think I have the mic there. So uh, we do have time for questions. I think what I'd like to do, since I don't know what happened to the wireless mic, is just to have folks uh, either uh, project from their seats or, or step up uh, with their questions. Um, so I'll just ask for a show of hands, questions for Professor Aronoff. We have a question right up front. So first I have a question for clarification. You're saying that you are of the mind of Netanyahu? Um, the um, scholar that you cited before, the first one, Netanyahu? Yes. Okay, so I guess my question then would be, does that not delegitimize other Jews because of the diaspora? Jewish people tend to like assimilate into the culture that they go into. So that, like for me, I'm Jewish. Obviously, I'm an Ethiopian Jew, so to say that, to, for the crypto Jews to not be recognized as Jews as the Ethiopians and the South African Jews have been recognized as Jews, does that not delegitimize Jewishness and like make some make Ashkenazic Jews more um, you ha as a requisite for being Jewish? Do you then have to be Ashkenazi too? Um, I guess like the part where he's saying that the crypto Jews, they're not, you know, they have Jewish customs, but that doesn't make them Jewish type idea that. Well, he doesn't think they were practicing. So here, so now I get your question. Mm -hmm. Great, it's a great Thank question. You. Um, we, we're back with the wireless mic. <laughs> Thank you for that question because it actually allows me to share a little bit of a, from a section that I skipped. Um, so Netanyahu's thesis is actually that they did not persist in these customs. This was disgruntled, the disgruntled neighbor, the disgruntled household help that knew that they could take that person down just by reporting, just go to the Inquisition, walk up those steps, stand before the tribunal and say, I saw her lighting candles. I've been watching, she does not spin at the spinning wheel on Sabbath, she's doing all that trademark stuff, and that's really all it took. So Netanyahu, to some extent, you could say, is recovering real assimilation. Let's leave it value neutral for a moment. He's saying there isn't some kind of magical continuity that's gonna persist for hundreds of years. They're converted, they're professing Christians. They, people kind of know based on their history, maybe even how they look or how the kitchen might smell, I'm kind of folding some of my stuff in, that they have a Jewish past, but it's just a certain bigotry that's not permitting them full access. So that, okay. And uh, so that's the first thing I would like to say. But I will share with you that Netanyahu, it is quite possible that part of his dismissiveness about this kind of cultural Jewishness is fed by some idea that assimilation is bad. Many of these people probably converted when they might have had the option to leave at another point. And he doesn't want to count them among the Jews for that reason. So you see, this is a separate kind of discussion than the first one that's a little bit more grounded. Um, and I'll just mention one thing. So Netanyahu, one of the contributions he made to the study of Murano history is he said, why should we read the inquisitional records to tell us about Jewish history? Why don't we see what the rabbis were writing in the time of the Spanish-Portuguese diaspora, in the Ottoman context? What did they have to say about the conversos? in Spain. 
Interestingly, quite often, the rabbis say in Tzfat or in Turkey, um, would, uh, let's say someone appears before them, it's a woman, she would like to remarry. She can't remarry because she's bound by Leverite ties. The brother of her dead husband is alive, and technically, according to Jewish law, she's married to him. I, okay, so she needs to be, she's standing right in front of this rabbi, saying, I'm stuck. There's no way I can get a writ of divorce or I can do a kind of ceremony with my surviving brother-in-law. And if you don't help me out of this, I'm stuck, can never start a family, cannot move on, there's no choice. So that rabbi in that moment says, you know what, you're not bound to him over there. He's not Jewish, you're free to marry. So Netanyahu says, see, let's read the Jewish sources. They say they're not Jewish over there. Yerushalmi, in his book, which I recommend to you very highly, says, actually, Netanyahu, you're misreading that source completely. That's not a rabbi making some objective claim about the realities in the Iberian context. That rabbi may have no first-hand knowledge at all about what's happening over there. It's simply a means by which to free up and to meet the immediate need of the person before him. Furthermore, he says, and now I'm circling back to your point, Yerushalmi says, furthermore, let's say that rabbi happens to, yes, have some first-hand knowledge of the typical way of life of the conversos in Iberia and disapproves and says they're no longer Jewish. Is the historian permitted to employ the same criteria as a rabbinic authority? Aren't we required as academics to kind of explore all kinds of other possible modes of Jewishness besides what a particular rabbi would declare as kosher or not kosher. So your comment really does get at, I think, the heart of some of this debate, back to your comment as well, which is an embrace of a modern Jewish identity, not so much about diaspora and difference in terms of Ashkenaz and world Jewry, but actually, is it okay to be a bagel Jew and to not be following rabbinic laws and not to have high rabbinic literacy, but just to kind of have an attachment to certain kind of styles of Jewishness and social practices of Jewishness without being a kind of highly educated ritual practitioner. I think part of why Yosef Yerushalmi wanted to tease out the Jewishness of the conversos was because he was a modern American Jew who had shed a lot of traditional practices. So he kind of identified with the Muranos as Jews who had shed a lot of what we would argue are recognizable traditional practice. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Shy group tonight, timid, timid group. Even contemporary applications to questions of ethnicity and social identity, religion and its place in identity today. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap wrap up a little bit early, a little bit ahead of time. Started late, wrapped up early, but that's just how, how, uh, how things are proceeding this evening. I'd like to, uh, to end with a round of applause for, for both uh, Professor Aronoff and also a special thank you to Professor Olds. And uh, we'll meet again a uh, week from tonight. Thank you.